Kuchoff, and he will tell us more about border floor demolition. Hello, uh, thank you for coming, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's uh, also a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk about border here, floor demolition.
than, than what can obtain this invariant tensor product, or some suitable derived tensor product. Uh, So the, the A, A means, uh, that, okay, sorry, uh, what did they mean? So A, A means that the holomorphic curve counting takes place in the algebra action, and this is saying the holomorphic curve counting takes place in the differential. That's, this is shorthand. Uh, sorry, I should, uh, I should make up a better story. That's actually, um, so, so, these are two different invariants. They count holomorphic curves a little bit differently. Um, so what what I would like to do is I would like to start with some sort of general abstract nonsense, and then I'd like to uh, uh, so that is to say I'd like to say a little bit about what this algebraic structure is, what this tensor product is, um, and then I'll talk about. Um, uh, then, and then, I, then I'd like to talk about our particular case. So I'll talk about what our algebra actually is. And I'd like to flesh out some of the miracles that Robert was referring to in his talk. And then uh, I'd like to keep going, but I'll probably run out of time. Okay. So, so let me just start with the... the um, the story of what... Uh, let me just start with the algebraic definition of what this object is. So, uh, okay, so uh, A is a, we're now talking about a, a DG algebra A, um, and, we're, we're, and when one can consider differential modules of a differential graded algebra, what are differential graded modules of a differential algebra? They're modules which are equipped with a differential. Um, which satisfies, of course, d squared equals zero. And they're also equipped, they're modules, so they're equipped with an algebra action. And um, <coughs> if this is a differential graded module, then, um, then, then the action is associated with So first of all, it satisfies the Leibniz rule. So my color coding is about, I'll explain in a moment. So first, I'll just say that it satisfies the Leibniz rule. And my, all my algebras over Z, are over Z mod 2, so, um, so I don't have to worry about the sign. So this is the code, shorthand for the Leibniz rule. This, what does this mean? This means that if I have a module element and an algebra element, then the action, and this is this the action, this is the differential. This is saying that dm times a plus m times dA plus the differential m times a is zero. And so we have an m coming in here and a and a acts the action of the differential. So so this is what what the uh, this is the uh, the Leibniz rule that it satisfies. And finally it satisfies the associativity law, which says that if you first act by one algebra and then by the other act algebra, that's the same as acting by the plot. Sign and this Yeah, actually everything is over C mod two, so they're not sign. Oh. Sorry. Um, okay, so we have an we have an A infinity module where everything holds only up to O one. So 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 the, what is what is what does that mean? That means that um, well sorry, not everything holds up to homotopy. This formula Associativity holds up to homotopy, which is to say that rather than being equal to zero, um, one has to throw in some correction terms, uh, which which look like uh, well, there's a homotopy operator which takes three inputs and one output, and when you take the differential of the three of the tensor triple product, that should so what, what am I talking about? This is supposed to be uh, dH plus HD, except the differential here is of n tensor a tensor b. So really this should have three terms in it. So what does that look like? So this is supposed to be the three, I'm going to just, they're going to be uh, <coughs> differential, the 
differential, differential, differential. Okay, so th this is this is the um, h of d of n tensor a tensor b. Those are these three terms, and then there's a final term which is the d of h. So this is this is um, <coughs> this is what um, equation that is required to satisfy. But then one can keep going. So um, so that is to say, this this new homotopy is supposed to somehow be compatible with the algebra action. So if you if you act afterwards by the algebra action or before, so this is A, B, and C, and your more alternative is have this A, B, and C, there should be some other relation. Um, and uh, and there's a pretty way of formulating all these relations, which is which is the following. Well, let's step back and look at. Look at where these trees came from. These are these are trees with two vertices. All of these, every every tree I've drawn, are trees with two vertices in them. And you can have you can contract, and they have an edge in them. So you, and you can, when you contract that edge, you get some fixed tree. So all if I contract the the sort of the edge between the, these two vertices and any of these three terms, I'll get the same one tree with. That looks like this. If I similarly perf perform those contractions in any of these three terms, I'll get the tree with two, two, with three inputs and one output. And and you can in fact think of this as kind of these are all the different resolutions of this tree. Or I mean, that's just a bad way. But all, all the different ways of inserting an edge into this tree. Similarly, these. And so more generally, they, one has an infinite sequence of relations, which correspond to all the different ways of taking a tree with n plus 1 inputs and inserting edges. So that's, that's what an A infinity module is. Now, why are A infinity modules uh, basic and fundamental and necessary? Um, so, uh, when, when uh, <coughs> for those of us who do holomorphic curve counts, You'll observe that these are these all look like ends of moduli spaces of some holomorphic disks. So that, that's why a, a holomorphic per, person might think that these things are are necessary. But uh, in fact, there's probably even a more fundamental reason, which is the following: some special case. But by the way, I, I'm talking here about a infinity modules over a DGA. Uh, this is um, in the sort of standard expositions. Uh, a kind of strange animal. When the first talks about talks about how one might change what a DGA is to an A infinity algebra, and then one talks about A infinity algebra, uh, A infinity modules over A infinity algebras. But I've chosen to take this real turn. This is what's needed for us. Okay. So, um, so where is where is this um, where is this Inevit why is this inevitable? Then? It's the following principle. So if you have n n, oh, let's say it this way. Um, if, if you have a DG algebra n, if you have a DG module n, so a DG module over a DG algebra, then you can then in trigon m is a chain complex. You can take its homology. Now you take the homology of the chain complex; it's going to lose the information of the algebra action. But the statement is that it still retains the A infinity module and, and, uh, structure. And, and how does it do that? So one has an well, maybe 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 I'll just I won't explain exactly how it does, but it's some sort of uh, nice principle that. The homology of n is an A infinity algebra over A infinity module. Okay, so 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 this is sorry. In a canonical way up to isomorphism. So, so, so this is this is why um, appearances of A infinity 
modules are not synchronized. Okay. okay. So um, now I'd like to uh, to describe what what tensor product we're working with. No, you know what? Instead of doing that, I'm just going to define the algebra. So, so now I'd like to step back and explain um, what what is the algebra associated to a point in X. Yes. Uh, when you make this transition, you take homology, so you're supposed to lose the differential which acts on this module. That's right. You, but in your picture, you do have a differential. So ah, well, so so nobody said it, it, nobody said it was non-zero. Oh. So you will get this picture with zero dot in zero. Yeah, that's right. So, so, yeah. Um, great. So now, now I'd like to, I'd like to step back. So, so, what, what is the algebra associated with a pointed match circle? So recall, a pointed match circle for us was was a circle with a marked point and these these matched pairs of points. So I'm going to cut along this this marked point to look at intervals. And I've got these sort of special distinguished smart points on these intervals now. And they're paired off as specified by a point in match circle. So I'm drawing here the split point in match circle, but one can have an arbitrary point in match circle. And I'd like to describe what the algebra elements are. But the algebra elements are given by tuples of strands which start and end at these distinguished points, and they satisfy some rules. So um, let, me do, let me do the case where I'm looking at two strands. Concreteness. So, so I'm going to have pairs of strands, and they, these are <coughs> upward bearing strands. So, 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 so my, my strands are all, so the out, let me just let me try to write some kind of complete sentences. The algebra is generated by pictures of k topics of strands. And the strands are upward veering. They start and end at undistinguished points. Or I should say maybe some of our distinguished points. And they have the property that um, if you look at the couple of initial points, no two of those are, are identified. So it would not be legal to start at this pair of initial points. So um, no two. Initial points are matched, and no two terminal points are matched. I'm going to unline and I'll fix it in a moment. No two terminal points are matched, and, um, and what else do I want to say? So, um, is then gotten by juxtaposition. You have a picture like this, you have another picture like this, you stick them together, and you look at the answer, up to homotopy. So these are, these are upward bearing strands. I don't care exactly how they appear upwards. You can think of them as linear paths. Um, so, so if I stick two of these pictures next to each other, I can form the relevant isotopy I'm supposed to get the product. So in order to have enough item points, I'm going to have to also increase my number of algebra elements. Uh, an item point would essentially be horizontal strands, but uh, but once you allow for horizontal strands, then um, one has to start relaxing some of these conditions. So let me 
let me say it this way. So strands are either upward veering or they're horizontal. But if they're horizontal, you think of them as sort of being half a strand. So I have a horizontal strand that goes across, then it must come with its matched pair. So they're either, or, they're either upward veering or they're horizontal half strands in pairs. So let, let me somehow like, let me just draw a picture. So <clears throat> suppose that we have an upward veering strand like this, and suppose we also want to have a horizontal strand starting it here. Then we're going to draw a dotted horizontal strand, and it must come with each thread. So, w with that understanding, um, y you, you have to relax the last two requirements. These are no two initial points uh, of, of, um, of the solid strand. These are no, no, no two temporal points of the solid strand. And now we're, we're almost done. I have to say a few products that are zero. So the product operation is what I said it was. However, there are a few, um, well, so there, there, there are a few things that have to be said. So suppose that we're trying to um, multiply the picture that I started with, which was <laughs> this. And suppose that I'm multiplying it by some picture that starts at, say, this strand and goes up to here, and say, this strand and goes up to here. So when I put the two pictures together, then this strand is starting at somewhere where a previous dotted strand le left off. So this, this solid strand is going to be a tiebreaker. So these two strands, they don't know whether they're here or here. It's like they're, um, they're, they haven't made up their mind. But the minute you make this multiplication, they this becomes solid and this gets forgotten about. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a rule in the product. Uh, another thing which, which, probably, which could almost go without saying is that if, uh, if the, uh, the, you've got a strand here and it, it's not the initial point of any strand in this picture, the product is declared to be zero. Uh, <laughs> That's also the case. Okay, so that's also the case if if this is say matched with something that's the initial point that doesn't help. So if you put the pictures together, there would be a gap here, and, and that's supposed to be zero. So so that's that's not, a, not that's that's not such a product is equal to zero. And there's a final product which is equal to zero, which is maybe less obvious, which is um, so in some picture you might have a crossing, and then in the next product you might have the same two strands crossing again. So when you put them together, you get a double crossing. Well, double crossings are supposed to set to zero. So that's, that's another rule in algebra. But with that understanding, we now have that, the product structure of the algebra. OK. Are there any questions? Mikhail? Any questions? This zero down here. Uh, this was the, if, if, if the terminal, st terminal points of these strands don't match with the initial points, they're zero, the product is zero, and, it, and, it's, and I've made it more confusing by explaining more than needed to be explained. So even if the terminal points here are matched with initial points here, but they're not equal to them, so such products are zero. So here we've got, we've got some strand that rises up to some point, which is matched with another point here, from which we continue that product is still zero. Unless, of course, this happens to be dotted, in which case, um, this is dotted like this, and the product wouldn't be zero, but we would just decide that we're taking OK, any questions? We still need to define the differential. I need to define the differential. OK, so what's the differential? The differential is a sum. So I, I've got now my pic, my, uh, one of these basic pictures. and. The differential is a sum over all the crossings of a bunch of terms. At each crossing, you take the upward veering resolution. So there's a unique, you know, two resolutions, but there's one that's, that maintains this positive derivative business. So, uh, I mean, this would be turning back that we don't, like, not, we're not interested in. If you look at the, the 
media upward viewing resolutions, and um, and that is the sum of those those terms, with the understanding that if when you perform this resolution, you introduce a double crossing, that pro that term is wrong. Uh, that's that's the differential. The differential. Yes, you do this with the dotted lines also. So except with, yes, you do exactly this with the dotted lines. So, so we have some dotted line. Well, when, when you resolve, again, that resolution has a property of being a tiebreaker. There are two match lines. If I do the resolution of this with this, then I have to solidify this and solidify this and erase that. But that's, that's what we do. And then you have another term that does other terms that handle the other strand. Okay, any other questions? Okay. So, um, <coughs> I'd like to now mumble some things about the type T structure. Um, the, the definition of CFD of a three manifold. Um, and, um, and rather than giving a complete formal definition, I'd like to just sort of uh, wave my hand as an example. So, so, so the starting point was a Hagar diagram for, for Y2, as Robert Dillon explained, a border Hagar diagram. So let me do, let me do an example. This is a genus one. Genus one. Surface. My, my collaborators. This is A. This is for all. This is alpha. So we have we have two alpha arcs. Alpha alpha one, which runs through this handle. And another one called alpha two, which runs through this handle. And it goes out to the boundary of my Hagar surfaces. Hagar surface G is one surface with boundary. And, uh, and as Dylan explained, so there's a single generator X, which is the single intersection of that. Oh, sorry, this is of course that beta surface. And there's the single generator where, where where beta intersects, beta one intersects alpha one. And, and now, we'd like to count, okay, so, so, so now we want to define a differential. So what is the differential of x? So this is um, like, um, you know, like, there's one generator x. So the differential of x is going to be a sum of, it's going to be algebra elements tensor x. Uh, so maybe I should say a few more. So, so CFD hat of, of Y in general is is a is a projective A of C module. multiply row two, so there, there, there's, this is a non-zero product. 
This is a non-zero product. And there's also a non-zero triple product. Um, and then there are two item problems. So I've just drawn six out for elements. And so the two item problems, which are this dotted pair and that dotted pair. Um, in th this particular case, our conventions are the following. Um, the, the element X gets acted on by the item potent, which is which is missing those. Okay, I'm sorry. So we have these alpha arcs that go out to the boundary. The places where they meet the boundary specify a point of match circle. And the item potent corresponding to a generator corresponds to those alpha arcs which are not occupied in the Hagar generator. So, so we've got this alpha 2 arc, which corresponds to this pair of dotted lines. We have an alpha 1 arc, which corresponds to this pair of dotted lines. Our generator occupies alpha 1. Therefore, we think of this generator as acted on non-trivially by the other item point, which is, uh, <coughs> which is not occupied by our generator, which are because those arcs or that arc that's not occupied by our generator. This is a convention of that choice of convention. Um, so we have, uh, so I don't know, we can call this iota not, and we can call this oh, hang, y is green. We can call this i, we can call this j. This other item point, and we now see that, that J times X is equal to J, and I times X equals to What's the differential? The differential has, there's a, what holomorphic disks does one see in a picture? There is a holomorphic disk, which is gotten by slicing along this alpha curve. So, remember there's a base point Z, and we're going to look at holomorphic curves that don't cross Z. So what we see here, right on, on the face of it, is a, is a holomorphic curve that a homomorphic disk that starts out at x and flows into x. But it goes out to the boundary twice. Uh, once it goes out, row one, row two, row three. Once it goes out to the boundary is row two. And the second time it goes out is row three. So the algebra element that we want to pick up is the product of the chords where it goes out to infinity. So in, by this convention then, the boundary of x is going to be row two. So remember, uh, our module itself is a free module, essentially a free module. Um, it's not quite a free module. I times this generator is equal to zero. It's essentially the, the J. It's the, it's the J A ideal, and it's equipped with this differential, which um, has a property of differential that the generator. So it's to be row two three times that generator. Okay. That evidently satisfies d squared equals zero because row two d squared equals zero. Okay? All right. So that's, this is an example of a type D structure um, associated to a, to a uh, 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 diagram. Uh, so um, Robert said that there was a miracle, which was that our um, the bimodules associated with arc slides were essentially determined by d squared equals zero and, um, and some, a little bit of input. And I'd like to explain how that is true. So I, I'd like to explain it. This is going to be extremely cheap. Uh, my, uh, my, my collaborators, if they were present or paying attention, would be very disappointed. But maybe the audience would actually be grateful for this. I'm going to do, an, do, do, do a, a very silly special case of this, where actually there's no arc slide. It's the, it's the identity of the module. So let, let, let's think about, about, about counting holomorphic curves in the, the uh, Hagar diagram corresponding to the identity of the homomorphism. So as uh, Robert explained in his talk, the, uh, this is great. It's like, Anytime I don't want to explain something, I just smear it on my collaborators. Uh, it works better if you're the first talk, if you just sort of push off to the, But anyway, I'm, I'm trying this with my. Uh, I'm trying it nonetheless, so you're welcome to call me on this. But so, as, as my collaborators explain, the, uh, the uh, Hagar diagram for the identity looks like essentially you'd like to say it's an angulus um, with a bunch of horizontal alpha curves, but there's a sort of special story, which is that you never want to allow any curves to go across. You always want 
cards that come in on this side to exit on that side. So we have to stabilize this picture a little bit. So here's a picture of the identity um, diagram for, let's not draw the torus, let's pretend like we're doing something more exciting than the torus. Let's do the genus 2 identity. Um, so we just, well, we draw this picture torus. This is A match with A, and this is B match with uh, B, and this is C match with uh, okay, fine, whatever. I'll draw one of these and insist that it's really upside down. Uh, so, so, so what, what, do we, what do we have here? Here we have an Alpha arc that runs through this handle comes out back here. Alpha arc that runs through this handle comes out back here. Similarly back here and, and similarly for the other side. Okay. So, uh, the type D structure here is going to be an algebra, is going to be a bimodule of the algebra of the left incoming pointed match circle and the right pointed match circle. But they happen to be the same. So, um, so this is <coughs> um, essentially an A of Z tensor A of Z module, but with a little bit of a, with the following understanding: um, What are generate a generator? <coughs> let, let me first define what the generators are, and then we're going to discuss how it's a module. Um, what are generators? Generators correspond for each beta circle, you have to choose what the alpha circles are. There are no alpha circles, so I won't even say that. You have to decide which alpha arc it gets occupied on, left or right. So, like, so um, let me try to draw a valid generator. Here's an example of a valid generator. So we said what the idempotent to this should be. The idempotent should correspond on the left to those sides, those parts that are, are not occupied. So this is like almost all horizontal lines are included except for these two. Whereas on the other side it's somehow exactly complementary. So so one has to understand that the algebras have a have a strands gradient, which is kind of the, number, the total number of strands um, counted with weights. The dotted ones count with half their weight, and um, these are the, these two algebras. This is like uh, um, this is an AZI, AZJ bimodule where I plus J is equal to uh, 2K, 2G, G is the chance of So they're somewhat complementary. Uh, great. Uh, all right. So these are the generators. Um, <coughs> the differential counts some fairly complicated holomorphic disks. Um, Rather than saying it in, in a great deal of detail, let me just give an example of a holomorphic disk in this picture. We have here a hexagon. This is, um, we have here uh, a rectangle, sorry, a rectangle that goes out to the boundary twice. Um, in sort of traditional, in the traditional story, um, you're, you're, um, much of my, uh, my audience knows and loves that this is meant to count as a differential in Hagar's local object. But a rectangle, this is really a disk in the second symmetric product, so there is an impact of holomorphic representative. So here we have almost the same picture, except now, um, of course, the, our rectangle goes out to the boundary and, at two corners. So, what I'd like to say then is that the differential of this x is um, is this element y tensored with this pair of chords, which are the two chords where it goes up to that. Okay, great. So now, what I'd like to say is that the type D structure. Uh, so, so we now have an A of Z, A of Z bimodule which is the bimodule 
in some sense associated to the identity cohortism. And um, you see already here that the holomorphic curves that one has to count are maybe slightly, um, very slightly subtle. They're not just disks that are rectangles. But if, if one looks at holomorphic curves that, that are bigger, then suddenly one has to actually count some pretty nasty things. So, so if you're imagining a holomorphic curve with sort of big support, it would contain handles on the inside. And it would actually be a, a nightmare to analyze by direct holomorphic um, arguments. But what do we know? So we want to determine this by module. And we don't want to do it by enumerating holomorphic curves. So, um, um, okay, so, so what are we going to do? Um, well, let, let's, say, let's first say what we know about these, um, what we know about this by module. Um, I want to just say, say what, we, what I've said so far, so sort of graphically. Um, the, we have our initial point in mesh circle. And generators of our by module are going to be ways of drawing arrows on this picture, where my, at each of these vertices, I decide if I'm pointing to the left or to the right. And if I point to the left at one slot, then um, my friend is also pointing in the same direction. So these two are matched, so if I'm pointing left over here, then this must also point left. And, and similarly for all the other ones. So this is an example of a generator. So <coughs> one can think of these as sort of complementary pairs of idempotents. So that we've got an idempotent, this is an, we've got an idempotent on the left algebra and an idempotent on the right algebra, and they exactly complement. <coughs> Okay? So I'm never allowed to point in both directions at any spot. It's not allowed. Okay, is that clear, clear what the generators are? In every direction has an arrow. And every direction has an arrow. That's right. Which point has an arrow. Okay, so those are the generators of my module. And, and I'd like to say <coughs> something about the differential. So the differential, what is that little rectangle that we have over there say. That rectangle says that um, um, that one thing it says is that this is actually not that generator. Um, that generator was um, pointing to the right here and the left here. What does that generator say? That generator says that the differential of this generator is this algebra element tensor this algebra? So how should we write this? I'm going to write this as black up here. Sorry. This is the initial point, and this is the terminal point. This is the generator that I labeled X, and this is the generator that I labeled Y. So that is to say, if I have a pair of, if I, if more generators. If I have a generator, and it points to the left somewhere, and it points to the right exactly one step above it, then there's a term in the differential of this element, which looks like the tensor product of somehow something of algebra element, which looks like the same chord on both sides, supported in this little region between those two arrows. It look, I say it looks like the same element. It's not, because the item points are different. So, so it, it's got the same moving strands in it, but the dotted lines are somehow exactly opposite. So uh, anyway, okay, so it looks like this sort of diagonal term, and, and the terminal item point of that is, of course, gotten by permuting. I, I've got, I, uh, uh, I do this, and I do this. I do this is dance move. So those are some terms in the differential. And, I'd like to say the following statement, which is there exists a unique A of Z, A of Z by module with, with the following properties. Um, it's induced 
from what we call the diagonal in some algebra. say what that is. So the diagonal sum algebra of A of Z, A of Z, the diagonal sum algebra is a sub algebra A of Z tensor A of Z, whose idempotents are complementary. And also the um, supports the algebra elements that are identified. So an uh, algebra element in our algebra, so if you think about the strands picture, you can associate to such a picture the local multiplicities, the intersection numbers with, with the various kind of, how do I say this? You can project vertically, and, and the vertical projection has a degree. So in each interval, you can associate a multiplicity. So for these little cores, the multiplicities look like zero almost everywhere and a one here. So what we want to say is that they're our algebra elements have complementary item points and the local multiplicities on both sides are identified. This is, this is what I mean by the diagonal subalgebra. So we, we're saying that there's a unique bimodal which is induced from the diagonal subalgebra. It's graded in a suitable sense, which I don't want to get into. And finally, um, so, so this is a subalgebra. Uh, if I, I have a, a uh, if I have b a subalgebra, a b a subalgebra of a, and I have a, a free b module, I can tensor up to get it, an a module. I see. So these other iron modules can operate on free. They do what? They operate on free. No, no, they 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 they, they operate true. So uh, what this really means is that um, that okay when I do something I get actually a bigger object, but that's only because I'm sticking on sort of algebra elements which which are I mean so for instance what's the element in the what's in the induced uh, module um, and the induced module might contain an element which looks like some algebra element times one of my generators, but it doesn't have the matching thing over here on the right. So it's no longer defined over the diagonal subalgebra. It's more general, but its differential is is induced from the differential of the uh, yeah okay. Uh, so. I thought before you were taking algebras on which your item book acted non-trivially and all the other factors acted trivially. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. But I don't, I'm sorry, I must have misinterpreted what you meant by an item point acting on trivial. Um, 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 so I ask your question again. Um,
contain the short chords. And what do I mean by that? I mean sort of tensor products of short chords. So, so I mean that, <coughs> that well, these differentials that I said are always present. The ones where, where I'm just um, performing this move on consecutive pairs. Now, the statement is that there's actually a unique such bimodulus determined by d squared equals zero, essentially. And, and I could I even explain, describe explicitly what it is. It's not so complicated. Um, it's, it takes, it has obviously more terms in the differential, but all the terms in its differential correspond to the same dance move. Except now, there might be intermediate stages. I've got some, some leftward pointing arrow on the bottom and some rightward pointing arrow at the top. And I spit out a diagonal chord, and it swaps these two so that the, the output has, has those two things swapped. Um, and that's what the, the bimodule is. Okay? Yeah? So is the statement that it's induced from the diagonal sub sub just saying that like the elements of the diagonal sub alpha are in correspondence with well, the actual generators that you broke down over here? Or? Uh, let, me, let me say what it means. It means that the differential has the form d plus multiplication by some algebra. The differential um, is a differential on some sum and of a tensor a. And as such, it is, it is of the form differential on a tensor a plus multiplication by some constant. Induced from the diagonal subalgebra means that that constant is in the diagonal subalgebra. Okay. Okay, so, maybe so how do you how do you know that uh, this bimodule over here is induced from the diagonal subalgebra? In holomorphic in holomorphic terms, or, or, or this particular one? This, this particular. This particular one you can tell because the, all the terms that I've described uh, are diagonal pairs of chords. So here the constant a is just going to be the sum over all kind of diagonal products of chords, and those chords have the well, same multiple good both sides. So, so I get the one coming from the, the right? Okay, so how do you know that this one is that news from diagonal subalgebra? That's simply the point that the local multiplicity of a chord here is always equal to the multiple multiplicity of a chord here because there are no beta circles in this interval. So like I just explained to Jacob kind of in this sentence, like half of the holomorphic curve that goes into this. It's very simple. It's just a sort of simple topological property. Okay? Of this Hagar diagram. Any other questions? So you've been concentrating on the differential. Well, I forget the differential. I'll just ask you what the module is. Okay. Well, I should have said, the, 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 on the type D structures, the module structure is boring. The module structure, they're, they're generated by, algebra, by generators x, and they have the form algebra element tensor to generator. The algebra structure is just given by left translation of this algebra element. In, for, for type D modules, the algebra structure is sort of stupid. You're giving me a left module there. Yeah. Type D structure is a left module. Oh, uh, how do I do a bi module? So actually, um, I should be calling them bimodule. I'm really thinking there's a left left module. So even though uh, actually a left a Yeah, it's a left a tensor. So the little a is a little bit of a tensor. That's right. It's almost free, it's projected. It's projected. I mean uh, it's, it's the sum of the factors that you broke Yeah, that's right. Any other questions? Okay. So, um, all right. So, <coughs> this is proposition of the universe. Um, um, well, so let me let me indicate why it's true. Is there a question? This only handles this case. Though, but what do you mean by this case? Okay. A priori, you have to count all this stuff. And what I'm now talking about is that there, there's actually a unique by A of Z, A of Z bimodule with these properties. And so, um, so that's 
on the one hand as an algebraic statement. On the other hand, if you look at this Hagar diagram, it's pretty easy to see that the DD identity by module satisfies those properties. Therefore, we can describe the DD identity by module. So, there's something about other by modules. There's something about other by modules. That's right. So, arc signs are a little more complicated than this, um, but they're not going to um, make it into this lecture. But the idea is the, the, the motivation comes from here. Yeah, there's a similar proposition. That's right. Um, okay. So, so let me indicate why this statement is true. Um, <clears throat> so we have a, a module, a bimodule, and what we know is that um, short chords are, appear in the differential. Let's well, say chords of length one appear in the differential, and I want to prove that chords of length two also appear in the differential. So, what happens if I apply d squared to something like this? I'll always pick up a term that looks like some kind of. Um, so, so, so th this is th this is the, sh the short chord appearing in our first term, and this is the short chord appearing in our second term. So here's a term in d squared. It's got to cancel something. So great. So we look at this product. It's got sort of three moving strands on it: one on the right, and two on the left. And we see how many ways you can factor. Well, there's only one way you can factor the new diagonal subalgebra. You can't factor this any other way. Um, because there's this sort of break here, any kind of other factorization is going to. But you could factor it by like, maybe you, ma you imagine it, that it's constant along here, and it goes like two up here. It's not, that doesn't have equal multiple single on its sides anymore. So this thing is not factorable. So at first you're worried. But then you remember what d squared equals zero here means that a times a plus da equals zero. So there's another term in, in, in d squared that could cancel this. And that's the differential of a different algebra element. And it turns out that the algebra element, there's the, well, I've said what the other algebra element ought to be. It's this length 2 chord, which is occupied, which has an item point, that has a horizontal strand going through here. So when you take its differential, then it induces a break here and it cancels precisely this. So that's the only possible term that could cancel this. So it's got to appear. And then there's an inductive argument. It's an inductive step. That shows that all of these chords, all these diagonal chords must appear. And then the gradings tell you that there can be no other terms. Uh, so that, that's, that's kind of a reason for that variable. Yes? This statement about the form of the differential comes from the fact that you're projected. This statement about the form of the differential it comes from the fact that I'm projective and, and in fact I've got one generator for each item point, so I don't have to worry about. So A is not a matrix, it's actually an algebra. Okay. It includes the Maslow component. It's, um, <coughs> yeah. You just have to make sure there's not some kind of ra completely random other term that appears in the differential. Um, that's excluded basically from Maslow for next reasons. And then you can take great pains to formulate that um, in algebra. Okay. Um, um, I don't know what to say. It's a miracle. It's like um, uh, the gods of math have smiled upon us or something. I, 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 uh, um, I, I know of no kind of a priori reason why such a proposition should be true on earth. It just happens to be true. And the way we, 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 we stumbled upon the proof, we were, these computations are really nasty if you do them directly by all of the curve counts. And then you start to realize, well, you know, if you look at the ends of one-dimensional moduli spaces of Holomorphic disks, then the, you know what kind of breakups they have. And that's, a, that's a way of forcing terms to have to appear. And you start saying things, you sort of repeat that argument over and over again, and then you realize that you're actually, you're, 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 pretend, you're pretending like you're doing geometry and analysis, but in fact, that geometry and analysis are all codified in the fact that these equals zero. So that's, 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 the, that's, that's the miracle here. Okay. Any questions about this? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, <coughs> yeah, I should I should say it's in the, I should say that its generators are. I'm sorry. It, it, generators are one of the one correspondence with item. I should say that. Um, okay. That's that whole thing. Um, 
So that's all. So there's a little bit of geometric input, you know, the common torx of what the generating set is, the common torx of how curves can, can act, and, and then an analysis of little rectangles, and everything else is free. Okay, so let me just sort of um, say a, a word about Matt's question, which is, in arcs, arcs lines are actually slightly more complicated. The Hagar diagram that, um, um, yeah, that Robert drew has sort of, I mean, the sort of boring bits that look just like what I've said so far, and there's kind of one exciting bit, which is where an arc slide is happening. And that indicates to you that there are generators of the types that I've already described, where everything is either pointing to the left or to the right, but then there's another type of generator, which is occupied down here. If that's occupied down there, then you must be occupied here, so you can imagine that <coughs> the corresponding statement is a little more complicated. So we now have two types of generators. And we now, we also know that this is a homomorphic disk, so we have to put in a little more input on short chords, and then it all comes out. And now, maybe um, for the experts, I'll make the following confession. Um, there are sort of combinatorially two slightly different situations. Um, one is where I'm doing a, an arc slide of this foot over this picture. And the other one is where I'm doing an arc slide of this foot over this picture. So the, the foot is coming in from either below or from above. And below or above makes sense because I have a base point. These two cases are actually slight, annoyingly slightly different. Um, this one is determined uniquely by d squared equals zero. But this one has, um, has an extra um, class of algebra elements which have kind of two small math objects. There's a, there's a holomorphic, if you think about kind of this region, it has, its math object index is, is small and that sort of screws up all these arguments. This is like, this is not true, but this is essentially, this is morally like a nice diagram. And this is morally like a diagram that's not nice. So, um, whole, holomorphic curve counts here are, are indeed combinatorial and uniquely determined. Here, they're not, but they're determined up to homotopy. So there's a, there's, the, the, the corresponding statement there is not that this is unique by, uniquely specified by d squared equals zero, but only that it is uniquely specified up to homotopy by d squared equals zero. But with that understanding, that, um, and it turns out that that choice is actually not too complicated. One, one can formulate that precisely. Okay, great. So I've now made it through half my talk, um, uh, and I didn't ma manage to say <coughs> um, about duality and how the two formulas, for formulations of the pairing theorem are. Well, actually, I didn't give a precise formulation of the pairing theorem with type A modules, I didn't say how, how the type D pairing theorem follows from it, but there is um, a preprint on the archive on that topic, so if you're really curious, either read that or, or uh, uh, you know. okay, um, do I have, I have a spot? Punch, it was a punch of this. 
So it, it, it has like a, it, I, if I understand what you're saying. It only has one generator attached to it. So you're, you're imagining yes. it's doing this. That there's yes. some, there are many things wrong with that, but one of the things that's wrong with it is that it, you're now counting a whole more thing. Uh, annulus with no cuts in it at all. Um, and it's in first symmetric product, so it's not. Right, but okay. So, so I mean, is it, is, it, is it obvious that this somehow, that it always works out that every domain gives you a sort of unique way to, um, to chop it up into a whole more curve? I think it's not true, actually. That, every, that there's a... So, I mean, there's sort of... So there, there could, in principle, be cancellations of different ways of chopping up domains. This, this particular picture is too small to, to give an example. Example. But there, um, if you already think about the DD identity by module, if I remember correctly, I think this domain, which is about length three, has kind of maybe even it has two canceling ways of chopping it up. I, I don't remember, it, but um, that's certainly an issue, uh, and that's one of the reasons why the algebraic statement is about the same. Uh, I mean, the way we used to do these arguments was that. In the type A structure, different homomorphic curves are better separated than the type D structure. The type D structure throws together different homomorphic curves. And the type A structure separates them some more. So the A infinity relation gives you kind of a priori more constraints so that they can make you make they can make these computations more precise. It's not it turns out there's not necessary. Yeah. I understand how you said that the last statement about so the corresponding proposition for this um, picture on the right is that there's two um, different algebras. And they, and they, and they, no, 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 it's not two different algebras. There's like, there, 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 there are many different modules that you can have. Yeah, but any two of them are homotopy equivalent. And you're only associating a homotopy class with modules? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so even with this prioritization, you only get a homotopy class. That's right. So is that with algebraic? It's algebraic as well. Um, so, so, so you, you, you actually codify what choice, what choice needs to be made. And it's, it, it, so, of course, you know, we all thought everything would be much simpler when we started. It, it, they were, they're pretty simple, but not as simple as we thought. So it's like, you know, you make some choice, and then that forces everything else. And then you can, you can change between choices by, by multiplication, by some, by, by some transformation to us um, too fancy. Well, I, 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 I sort of thought I sketched it. I, the, the point was that, like, the argument that I gave was was forcing these high, bigger quartz to exist. And so it's an inductive argument. You eventually show that all all long quartz exist in the differential, and and then and the fact that nothing else exists. Given by some great state. So it's it's actually it's out. I mean this, this picture, I mean, especially when you wrap up into the way that you were long in terms of having less uh makes it all sound very simple. Is there a is it possible way to guess what the plot structure looks like? I mean, how to is there any chance that when you Boil things down to these pi modules. If you actually compute the sort of pi modules that uh, you track the basic um, I That would be great. Of course, that, like that's what we hope is the case, but we haven't yet formulated the plus. Uh, but yes, so the, the hope is that these um, that <coughs> these algebraic constraints are somehow logically different from the ones that come from nice diagrams. There. They're a different world, so this should could conceivably give us a, another approach to um, I was just thinking about how the formulating algebraic for the first in terms of the final Yeah, well, uh, it, it seems like you have more of a chance of Yeah, okay, so okay. Yeah. Um, um, there there are earlier things that we don't understand well enough, like what the algebra is.
So first of all, as you know from the schedule, we don't have any talks scheduled in the afternoon, so you have three half day, and there are some suggestions as to what you can do. So it's promised uh, that it will be a rather hot day, so you can go to the beach. There is a park nearby. We don't have any transportation arranged for that, so you'll have either to organize to uh, well to find someone who has a car. There are taxis, of course, and of course you can also walk to the beach. It's like a mile walk, so it's probably an option not for everyone, but well, if you actually you can definitely do that. And there are directions available right next to the exit. And another announcement is that, unfortunately, it soon will be time to think about getting back to the airport for those of you.